Okay, hello everyone. This is lesson 4.9. We're going to be talking about antiderivatives today. Antiderivatives are the opposite of derivatives. So we're kind of going to use all our same rules we've been learning all along about derivatives, but just take them one step backwards. Um, I'll show you what I mean uh, with some examples. Okay, so um, antiderivatives are going to be really important for the next like the rest of the course actually um, so we're kind of starting this is kind of a preview to what we're going to be doing in the next few chapters um, and it all connects together in a really cool way that you'll find out about in in a couple of sections from now okay so um, we're going to go backwards so if I was asking you what the derivative of sine x would be it would be cos x but when I'm asking for the antiderivative I'm asking for the function that if you took its derivative it would be sine x so um, and we label it typically with a big F. Um, we don't have a nice symbol for antiderivatives, just like big F or big G, whatever like the letter is. Um, so here, the antiderivative is actually negative cos x. Now, um, let me show you why. So if I was going to take the, this is how you can always check. Now, if I want to take the derivative of big F, I should get the original function back. So let's check. So the derivative of, so the negative would just stay there because um, it's just a constant, negative one. Now the derivative of cos x is negative sine x. Now these two negatives would cancel, wouldn't they? And they would equal sine x. So I get my original function back. Um, there's one extra piece. We do, like there could be an extra number added here, like a two, for example, um, because if I was taking the derivative of that two, it would be zero and it would be, it would go away and it would still get sine x. I could actually put any number there. I could put 17 um, because the derivative of 17 is zero. Um, so you could put any, add any constant to the end of this antiderivative and it would still give f of x back when you took its derivative. So we just use a big C to represent that random constant that could be added. Um, you always have to put this big C here when you're doing an antiderivative. Um, in the next example, we are going to be able to solve for what that constant is, but for now, we just put the C if we're not given any other information. Okay, next example, 1 over x. So I have to think of what function would have 1 over x as its derivative, and then I remember, oh yeah, when I take the derivative of ln x, the derivative is 1 over x. And again, you can check. F, big F prime X would be, yep, one over X, because derivative of ln X is one over X. Um, so you typically it's just recognizing what you would use, um, and then we always have to put the plus C. Now here's where it's a little bit complicated. We don't have nice rules yet for any like products or quotients. We don't have like an anti-quotient rule or an anti-product rule or anti-chain rule yet. Um, so if you are given some kind of product, you have to expand it first before you can do the antiderivative. Expand first. You can't just do the antiderivative of each product. It doesn't work like that. Um, when you do your check, you'll figure out it doesn't work. So first, before I do any antiderivative here, I'm going to expand this out to so multiply this x in. So I'd have 4x cubed plus x to the power of 3 over 2. 1 plus 1 half is 3 over 2. Now, when you do the antiderivative, so when I'm doing the derivative, I would bring the power down and reduce it by 1. So I'd multiply by the power and reduce it by 1. When you're going backwards, you move the power up and you divide by that power. So it's like you do the opposite. So we divide by 4. And then here, we're going to bring the power up by 1. So 3 over 2 plus 1 is 5 over 2. And we're going to divide by that power. So 2 over 5. Dividing by 5 over 2 is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. I can write that a little nicer. Oops, sorry, I don't know why I wrote f prime x. It's just f of x. f of x would be x4 plus 2 fifths x5 over 2. So you bump the power up by one and divide by the power when you're going backwards. Let's double check to make sure that was right, because that looks a little bit complicated, more complicated than the first one. But anyways, so let's just do a little check here. So the derivative of my big F should always be the original function. Okay, the derivative of x to the power of 4 is 4x cubed. Yep, that matches. 
Now I have two fifths here as a constant. Now I bring the power down, five over two, reduce it by one. The derivative of C is just zero. Now we see that these two cancel each other out, so I do end up with three X over two. Yep, so it matches, it's all good. Okay, so bump the power up by one and divide by the power. Okay, so we always have to, I was talking about the C, this constant you always have to add because um, it's possible that there could be an extra number added. Now there's sometimes where if you're given more information, you can actually solve for what that constant is. Okay, so that's gonna get, be in the next example here. So in this example, it says, find f of x if we know the derivative is e to the x plus six x squared. So we're gonna do the antiderivative to get f of x. We know it's derivative, we're gonna go back a step. So f of x, we know is gonna be um, e to the x, the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x, so that one's easy. Here we're gonna bump the power up by one and divide by the power. So bumps from two to three, and then we're gonna divide by three. I can write that a little bit nicer. Then we have our plus c, of course. e to the x plus two, x cubed plus c. Now, typically we don't know what this constant is, but in this case, we're given another piece of information which we can use to solve for the C. So this is step two now, we're gonna solve for C. We are gonna plug in X equals zero and the answer should be six. So we'll be able to figure out what the C is based on that. So F of zero equals six implies that when I plug in zero, E to the zero plus two times zero cubed plus C, the answer should be six. Now, e to the zero is one, two times zero cubed is zero, plus c equals six. Okay, so c should be five. Okay, there we go. So now I have my final answer, I've got my c. f of x equals e to the x plus two x cubed plus five. Now we can always check to make sure we got the right answer because I can take its derivative and see if it matches what they said the original derivative was. I'm gonna do my check in red so it doesn't look like it's part of the question. f prime x equals e to the x plus six x squared plus zero. Yep, it matches the original derivative that they gave us. Okay, so the main application you're gonna see in this section is to do with position velocity acceleration, which is a common theme throughout this course, really. We've seen those applications a lot. At the top here, I'm just gonna write, before we even get into the question, I'm just gonna write um, something that is gonna come in handy. You probably wanna put this on your notes page, actually. Velocity acceleration, especially if you're not a physics student. You get to have this little diagram or visual here. Okay, so the position function is usually given S of T. Sometimes it's H of T if it's height. Um, I think we'll use H of T in this one, or H of T. Sometimes I use F of T. Now, when I take the derivative of the position function, that's how the position is changing with time. The velocity graph, we don't call it S prime of T, we call it V of T, just for velocity, okay? But it is the derivative of the position function. If you take the derivative again, it tells you how fast the velocity is changing with time. Um, and that gives you the acceleration. It would be the second derivative of the velocity, but we just call it the acceleration A of T. This is the order that we've gone in so far in this course. We've always been given the position or the velocity function and then taken the derivative to get the velocity or the acceleration. Now in this question, we're gonna go backwards um, because in some problems you actually don't really know the position or velocity function. It's more practical or uh, more is known about the acceleration. We'll see in this question. Um, so we, if we want to go backwards and we start with the acceleration, you would just take the antiderivative to go back and get the velocity, and then you would take the antiderivative again to get the position of the particle or whatever object we're using. Okay, so now that we know that, let's look at this um, example. So we're throwing a ball. Um, it has a speed of 48 feet per second. Um, so yeah, and we'll write down what we know in a second, but let's just read it first. So it's initial speed 48 feet per second. 
um, from the edge of a cliff, 160 feet above the ground, that's gonna be important. Find its height above the ground T seconds later. So we wanna find, we wanna eventually get to this position function. Now, um, in physics, uh, acceleration is a constant um, when you're dealing with a falling object. Um, if you're working in feet per second squared, it's negative, this is approximate, it's not exactly, but um, it's, a, it's a constant number and it's negative 32 feet per second squared. If it's in meters per second, it's about 9.81 or sometimes people round it to 10. Um, it's negative because the ball is falling, so the acceleration is towards the ground. Okay, so we know the acceleration. We're going to start with the acceleration that is known and we're going to end up with the position function. That's what the question is asking for. Okay, so here's what we know. We know the acceleration. It's just a constant number. It's negative 32. We don't know the velocity yet, but we do know that the initial velocity, they tell us that is 48 feet per second. They told us that that's how fast the ball is thrown upwards. Sometimes the velo initial velocity is going to be zero. Like a lot of um, applications you'll see is the ball is just dropped. In that case, the initial velocity would be zero. In this case, it does have a speed. And we know the initial height, I'll use H of T here, is 160 because that's how tall the cliff is and we're standing on top of the cliff. Okay, so we're going to use all these facts to go backwards. Um, let's actually do it in the order that we have it here. That'd be kind of a nice way to set it up. So A of T equals negative 32. We don't know the velocity, but we do know the initial velocity is 48. And we don't know the height function, but we do know the initial height is 160. Okay, um, so let's do the antiderivative of this to get the um, velocity function first. You can't go all the way to the position right away. You have to go through the velocity. Okay, so the V of T will be the antiderivative of negative 32. So we're just going to add a T on the end there because the derivative of negative 32 T would be negative 32. Um, we're using T instead of X because it's time. Okay, and plus I have to put the constant on. Now I'm going to use that initial velocity to solve for the constant. So I'll do that now. So I know that V of zero equals 48. That means when I plug in zero into here, my answer has to be 48. In this case, that just simply means that the constant has to be 48. Because zero plus 48 would be 48. So my velocity equation is negative 32T plus 48. I'll box it in so that we can see these and pick them out easily. Okay. Now I'm ready to do the antiderivative and get the height function. So I've got my velocity function there boxed in, and I'm going to do the antiderivative of that to get the height. So here's my height function. It's going to be, so for this first one, the power or the exponent on the t there is 1. So I'm going to bump it up by 1 and divide by that number. And then for the 48, I'm going to add a t. And then I also have a constant to add on. I'm just going to get rid of this arrow because it's in the way. Okay, I can write that a little bit nicer. Negative 16t squared plus 48t. And again, you can check this, take the derivative of that. You'll see it, it is equal to the velocity. And now we can find the height by plugging in zero. And I have to get 160 with whatever constant I'm going to be given. So when I plug in zero here, I have to get 160. So that means c has to be 160. So here's my final height function, negative 16t squared plus 48t plus 160. And then you could answer, sometimes there's going to be more questions that follow this, like when does the ball hit the ground? You could use your equations to um, solve for that, or like what is the velocity when the ball hits the ground, et cetera. Okay, um, but for this one, oh yeah, it does say, when does the ball hit the ground? So let's use our height equation to do that. But just to review here before I solve that part, um, we started with the acceleration, we found the antiderivative to get the velocity, and then the antiderivative again to get to the height. You can double check and take the derivative, start from the height and take the derivative twice, and you'll see you get to negative 32, okay? Okay, so now let's solve for when does the ball hit the ground? We have to interpret that into our equation. 
Well, it hits the ground when the height is zero. So we have to find the time that when we plug it in, we get zero. Um, so you can solve it a couple of ways. You can solve by factoring or um, by the quadratic equation. In this case, it is factorable. I always prefer factoring, but if you prefer the quadratic equation, go ahead and use that. So we're solving this equation. Um, you can factor it at a negative 16 here. So it would be t squared minus 3t minus 10. And that factors to t uh, minus 5 t plus 2. And um, there are two zeros, but one of them is irrelevant here. t equals 5 seconds and t equals negative 2 seconds. This one's irrelevant because time can't be negative. We're not going to keep going backwards in time. So the ball hits the ground um, after five seconds. I'm just going to type that because it'll be faster. Ball hits the ground after five, or at five seconds. T equals five seconds. I'll just make it in the same font that we have already. Make it consistent. There we go. Make it a bit bigger. So that's the main application you're going to have in this antiderivative. Section is just working from the acceleration um, back towards the position function. We've always gone the other way in past questions. All right, that is the end of the lesson, so I will stop the recording now.